Welcome back to MedBreak, where I too feed you information about medical education, but really about the pursuit of the sense of fulfillment in anything that you do during your break. I'm Dr. Sam, a resident physician. We're in the middle of a three-part series on why, as a doctor, I'm trying to convince you to not become a doctor. Remember, there is a deeper meaning behind why I'm doing this, and that'll be covered in the next section, part three. So let's go right on ahead with part two, where I talk about medical school, residency, and becoming an attending. Med school. So you made it. Congrats. This is a huge accomplishment, so you know, congratulations to you. But so have all of your other classmates who also killed it during undergrad. And now you'll be compared against them. Some of you might be asking, oh, aren't some med schools pass or fail? True, their book learning years might be considered pass or fail, but Keep in mind that all medical schools that partake in the residency match, which every one of them do, they're required to rank their students somehow and place them into these quartiles, the top 25%, 50%, and then so on. And this becomes a part of your residency application. Getting ranked based on your performance on clerkships, which is where you go see patients and then you get evaluated by different doctors that you work with can be good or bad. It tends to be more subjective and it can depend a lot on who you work with and how nice they are. Maybe you luckily work with a person who likes giving good grades to all of his or her students. It's something that as medical students, we complained a lot about. One thing that a lot of students remember is that there are tests and quizzes constantly and it gets so tiring. For our cardiology organ block, we had to memorize a 480 page textbook in about two months. And that was just one of three classes we were taking. A test questions could literally be from a single line in the textbook. After your book learning years, you'll be seeing patients during your third and fourth year, majority of your time, but there's still written tests after your clerkship rotations anyway. When do you find time to study for these tests when you're doing your best for the patients that you're working with? You'll have to figure it out. A major source of stress during medical school is definitely the board tests. Typically, the step one test. The step one, usually taken between your second and third year of medical school, is a standardized test taken by every medical student and gives you a score. This score is very important because residency programs can easily compare and weed out applicants that they want to interview for their program. This score can determine what specialties that you can go into because some of those specialized, really competitive specialties, you need a really high board scores. And even if you're pursuing something that's not as competitive, these popular programs in really popular locations like Southern California or New York, they are saturated with strong applicants, so you might want to get a good score to go to those locations too. Starting with this year's uh, entering class, there won't be a step one test that is scored. It'll be pass or fail. But don't worry, residency programs will find something else to compare you guys on. People are thinking most likely the step two CK, which still gives you a score and probably putting more emphasis on your letter of recommendations and your research activities to draw the attention of these residency programs. I probably studied around eight to 12 hours in a given day in medical school on top of all these small group activities and the lectures that we had to go to. And during the step one studying time, I spent about 16 or 14 hours every day studying. I just ate, slept, went to the bathroom and studied repeat. Something that a lot of medical students didn't know, even entering medical school, is the presence of this honor society called AOA, Alpha Omega Alpha, which is a honor society where only 15% of your medical school class can get into, if your school has it available. Not every med school has it available. And there will be an internal committee in your medical school who looks at everyone's academic performance, evaluations from their uh, attendings, research activities, volunteering, leadership, what have you, to determine the top 15% that kind of represent the cream of the crop. Some residency programs like to use uh, this AOA to brag that this many residents who are incoming were AOA as a bragging right. 
or to show the strength of their applicants or their residents. If you are a student who wants to go into a competitive specialty, you will set your goal uh, to be inducted into AOA eventually, and then that is even more stress. During medical school, you will likely be in your mid-20s, early to mid-20s, and some of your friends would have started making serious money. They'll be having college reunions without you. You will see it in Instagram and Facebook. You might miss major events in your family, like weddings or holidays with your family, and then missing concerts, shows, and major events that are happening around your city becomes the norm. And guess what? No more summer vacation. I did not really think about summer vacations coming into medical school, but when they told me that I don't really get to have one anymore, I was, you know, a bit sad. Unlike law school and business school where you do get summers and they usually work at an internship pulling in a lot of money, you don't get one. If you want to go into something competitive like plastic surgery or orthopedic surgery or dermatology, then you might be thinking about doing research. Somehow you have to make more time to be able to do research on top of all that studying. If you want to do anything like volunteering, that's just more time away from learning the material in your classes. All of your hobbies will slowly vanish, maybe except one. And that's what they tell you. You can, and you should, continue to do your hobby, but maybe just select one because that's all you'll have time for. A lot of students select that one hobby to be exercise and they go to the gym often. Your health will deteriorate for sure. Your eyes will get worse from all that reading that you're doing and working with the computer a lot. Usually the first thing to go when you get busy is exercising. Even at the end of medical school, you don't know a lot. You wouldn't feel comfortable seeing any patient by yourself. You might be able to give little tips here and there to your family members and feel good about it, but by no means work in any clinical settings or in the OR. And to plan for the next stage in your medical school career or medical education, getting ready for residency application, going to all those interviews, and then waiting until match day to see where you'll end up. It's also fun again. So again, you don't have to deal with any of this if you chose not to become a doctor from the very start. Time for a quick snack review. And I'll be reviewing this delicious snack called Honey Butter Chip. This is a very unique product because I've realized over the years there is more and more Western influence that are entering the Korean cuisine, including snacks. And the potato is from the US, it says in the ingredients. And it says the gourmet butter is from France right here. There's a picture of an Eiffel Tower. So this is literally Western influence on the Eastern culture, including food, I guess. But this is so delicious. Who knew sprinkling tastes of hints of honey into a salty potato chips would make it so good? It is very thin and very crunchy. If you go to any mom and pop Asian store or more likely a Korean store, this has to be there. It was so popular when it came out. These chips are huge and very thin. So it gives you the illusion that you're eating, not eating that much. So you can probably finish this bag by yourself, but your friends will definitely want to taste it too. Now you're starting your residency. Internship is just a fancy word for the first year of your residency. I think that's the easiest way of explaining it. By now, a lot of your friends are moving on with their lives. A bunch of them are getting married, starting families, switching jobs, and getting promoted, moving to exciting cities, and living life, and having the time of their lives. And you will see it on Instagram. Residency actually can be pretty exciting because you become a little bit more autonomous. You're more independent in caring for a patient, but you still have ways more to go. The pay isn't that great, and it's non-negotiable. A lot of residents like to calculate their wage per hour and determine that it is actually less than minimum wage because they work so long hours and they get paid relatively little compared to that. The residency salary is provided by Medicare, basically government tax money, and your institution sets the price. By this time, you would have started making student loan payments Starting six months after your medical school graduation, your loan companies will send you countless reminder emails that you're, you're due to start paying back these loans. The length of training is not short. 
Again, it's from three to seven years, depending on the specialty that you go into. On average, probably closer to four years. And that's like repeating medical school one more time. If you want to do fellowship, which is specializing even further after your residency, that comes with its own doing research to impress those programs and going on interviews, getting letter of recommendation to try to go into a really good fellowship program or do it near where you want to, like near your family or you have a significant other at this point. Again, you don't have to do any of these if you just don't choose to become a doctor. Whew. So you've done your undergraduate, you've done your medical school, and you've done your residency, and now you are a full-fledged independent attending, wearing that MD or DO like a badge, and now you're out there to save the world and affect patient lives. You have full responsibility over the health of your patients, and that can be scary. I think one of the most anxious people in the hospital are the newly minted attendings who are on service for the first time. Now, there's no one to check over their work and to sign off on. So you might have to take calls from patients overnight, or you might even have to go in and see what's going on to the hospital in the middle of your sleep and still work the next day, which can be very tiring if this happens multiple times in a row. Let's talk about surgeries for a little bit. Surgeries start at around 7 a.m., meaning you'll have to get up around 6 a.m. at least every day. If you don't like to get up that early, then maybe surgery is not for you. And talking to some surgeons, you know, they get really worried when their hands start to get shaky. And you might imagine your hands getting shaky when you're 80 years old, but that's not always the case. You don't know when your hands are gonna start shaking. It might even happen as early as in your 40s uh, or in your 50s, and you will lose confidence in your surgery skills. And even as attending, you're working with people, for people, so there will always be conflicts. You'll have to address patients who might want to abuse the system, who wants to just use your license to get what they want. And if you don't give it to them, then they will just doctor hop until they get the thing they want, maybe a certain medication or a certain kind of treatment. As you're in a workplace, you will have mean colleagues, hospital administrators, trainees, and patients. I didn't realize this coming into medical school, but there is a lot of political strife with other occupations in terms of who does what. The ones that are in the forefront are you know, family medicine doctors and NPs, who does what. Can NPs see patients independently? Can they open their own clinics and pretty much work without the supervision of doctors? CRNAs versus anesthesiologists, you know, how much supervision does CRNA need? And there's optometrists versus ophthalmologists, you know, can optometrists can do procedures that ophthalmologists can do? Of course, obviously not extensive surgeries, but at least some of the laser procedures and some of the more minor procedures. And in radiology, are AI, artificial intelligence robots gonna take over and we won't need radiologists anymore. Hospitals could opt out for the cheapest option, not necessarily the safer one, but this will be an ongoing debate forever, I feel like. And there are other miscellaneous things, like if you have a global pandemic, then your hospital doesn't have enough protective equipment to save you, so you end up contracting disease and you die. A lot of healthcare workers have died during this pandemic, and it's truly sad to see, especially when a trainee or resident dies because they've put in everything in their life into their work and has been delaying living their life with a delayed gratification, but they couldn't even enjoy that. And a lot of times they will have student debts that their family will be now responsible for. During this pandemic, you hear of contracts being canceled or your pay being cut. This is kind of unrelated, but how much people get paid, how much doctors get paid for their work is always changing. For example, cataract surgery used to bring in $2,000 per procedure, but now it has reduced to $500 this year. And I'm sure a lot of ophthalmologists aren't happy about that. And if you choose to open a private uh, company and go into private practice, that's just like running any other business. It comes with its own risk. And a lot of these private practices are struggling during this pandemic because their state has not allowed them to see uh, patients or you know operate for a, a long period of time and they have staff on their payroll that they're still responsible for. That's it for this video. Remember, this is just me talking. Do whatever you want to do. You'll be fine. As always, ask any questions you have in the comment section below and watch for part three of the series where I'll be talking about 
love and money, and also the deeper meaning behind why I'm making these videos. Have a nice day. Your break time's over. Go back to work. One, two, three.